Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Nate, and today I've got a kind of interesting one for you. We're gonna go over some more advanced Unix concepts. Uh, I say more advanced because obviously we're all coming in to this video with a different level of experience. Uh, if you're one of my students and you're just getting into using Linux and Unix, then this video is probably gonna be a little bit out of uh, sort of mental grasp. Uh, but if you've been working with Linux terminals for a long time, then maybe you already know all this stuff. So uh, I'm making this video to get some more concepts out there that you may not be aware of. I'm using the word advanced in a sort of, uh, you know, sort of contextual way, uh, but hopefully you get something out of it. I am building a channel here aimed at teaching poorly taught concepts, things that took me a long time to learn. So if you do get anything out of this, appreciate a like on the video to get it out to more folks. Subscribe to the channel for more of it. I'm putting out these videos about three times a week. But with all that said, we're going to get right into the video. So for this segment of the video, we're going to go over file descriptors and we're going to talk specifically about alternative file descriptors, right? So you might be familiar with your three common ones, standard in, standard out, and standard error, uh, but there's actually more file descriptors we can use. And on most modern systems, that's up to a full um, two byte integer value, right? So uh, that would be 65,535. Uh, on older systems, it's only one byte value, so it would be 256. Um, but so we're in a Kali environment here, like we typically are, right? And so we're gonna go to uh, just the first example I've written. And in here you can see we've got a test file and then a bash script. And so if I just cut out the bash script, you'll see um, we've got, and this is actually from a GitHub, I'll include it uh, in the description. Uh, it's just a nice script that somebody wrote. Uh, basically what this is gonna do is it's going to take uh, the odd lines and write them to standard out here. And then it's gonna take the even lines of the input and write it to um, file descriptor three, and then use that from file descriptor three to send the even lines to a separate text file. And so what the script is doing is it's taking uh, a file and using an additional file descriptor to send data to an even file or an odd file, um, sort of at the same time. And so if we run this, um, I've got an example file, right? A test file. So if I cut that out, you see we've got four lines. And now if I pipe that to the um, bash script that we have, called even odd, um, we're gonna get two new files. We're gonna get an even file and an odd file, right? Because here we had it create odd from standard uh, standard out, and then from file descriptor three, create even. And so we can cut these out, uh, even, right? Even lines, right here, even. And then the odd, of course, just to prove that we are, we are working like we should be, uh, this is the odd file descriptor, right? And so the second part of this, just to further prove this point, we're going to go to file descriptor two, um, just the second example of this. And so um, if I, let's just cut out the standard streams.c file that I wrote. And so essentially this is just saying standard in is a static file that represents a certain file descriptor, right? And so if you aren't familiar, uh, standard in is where we would type into um, the terminal and it's a stream that allows us to send data into most applications. So most applications are just taking data from standard in, then they're going to send data to standard out, which ends up showing up on our terminal. And then additionally, we have standard error where errors are thrown and we can handle them um, through a third file descriptor, a file descriptor two. And so if I just print these out, um, we're gonna use from, uh, not from standard IO, but from this additional library, we're gonna read these uh, specific static variables. And so I compiled this and I'm just gonna run this um, standard streams and you'll see uh, standard in zero, standard out one and standard error file descriptor two, right? And so what can we do with this? Well, this other file, I'm not gonna show you the source yet, but if we print a standard, uh, print, print a, a file descriptor, right? We run it, we get hello standard out. And this, so this text was sent to standard out, but this binary actually is doing something else. And so if we say, take what came into this program's file descriptor three, because each file descriptor is sourced locally to the program. Uh, we now wanna grab what's coming into file descriptor three and redirect that to file descriptor one, standard out, right? And so now we see, we also got this data uh, coming out to file descriptor three, which were redirected to standard out so we could see it. And if we look at the source, you can see that um, we're using this dprintf to print to a specific file descriptor. And so the first one obviously is just going to um, to standard out. And we're saying hello standard out, right? But the second one we're saying send it to file descriptor three. And we can choose any value up to 65535 here. 
so hopefully it's informative. Um, but this is just a, an overview of file descriptors. File descriptors are generally used for uh, basically allowing programs to do additional things um, rather than just send data to the standard um, file descriptors. And we're actually going to show uh, tmux and cat out the process memory uh, for tmux using process files to show an example, a real world example of a process doing this. Uh, we're going to do that next. All right. So for the next portion of the video, next segment, we are going to talk about uh, expand on the idea that everything is a file, right? The idea that everything is a file in Linux is pretty standard knowledge. It's pretty common. Um, everything in Linux is a file. If you didn't, if you weren't aware of that, uh, processes are represented by files and everything that sort of happens, even file descriptors, like we just talked about, uh, they're actually uh, effectively files that are managed by the kernel, um, to pipe data between, um, different running processes, running binaries. And so what we can do is because everything is a file, we have some unique opportunities as a systems administrator. And specifically here, we're going to show, we're just going to list out, we're in Tmux, right? So we're going to grep for the Tmux process and we'll see it's at 132.616. And now we can actually go into proc. So we can go into proc, the process uh, ID, and then list this out and see all of these different files about that process. And interestingly here, we can actually get a lot of information with that process just by catting these files out. And for example, we just talked about file, file descriptors, right? Um, if we are actually, this going to be a long listing. Uh, if we long list the file descriptor directory here, you'll see we've got these different files that are symbolic links to specific things. And so these are ways that, you know, you send data around. These are the file descriptors, but by catting or listing out this directory, uh, some files we cat, uh, some files you just list or some directories you would just list out right here. We can see all of the different file descriptors and exactly what they're doing. Right. So, uh, standard, uh, in standard out standard errors. And then we got file descriptors three through nine doing other things, uh, you know, pipes, sockets, uh, pseudo terminals, right. Whatever else. So this is a really interesting way to get additional information about the system. Uh, another example of this, say we want to see, um, how this was called, how this, uh, how tmux was instantiated um, we can do a command line and you can see it was just called by running tmux and so if a process was started say like a terminal was started with arguments you could cut out this file uh, command line for the process id <clears throat> to see information about how that was called um, additionally right like environment variables you can get with environ right and so this would be the environment for the process rather than for you as a user uh, and so lots of interesting things we can do here, but the point being that everything is a file and this section is really just about uh, retrieving process information using that concept. So the third segment we have, third segment of this video is uh, about magic bytes. So with everything being a file uh, on Windows systems, typically we define our files with an extension. So if you have a text file, you would do .txt. If you have an executable, it might be .exe or something else. Uh, in Linux systems, Extensions are sort of just a informative piece of the, the file name. They don't really, most, most processes are not doing anything based on those, those file names. Instead, what they use is something called magic bytes. And these magic bytes, uh, I'm going to put up a, a, Wiki, a Wikipedia link in the description that you guys can use to look these up. Uh, there's a big table. But they're essentially a leading series of bytes at the beginning of the file that identify what the file is. And there's some really interesting things that we can do here. So we've got this Python script catcall.py, uh, and we use that to retrieve this cat.jpg file. I can prove that to you by going to desktop YouTube magic bytes. And we see we have a cat.jpg, right? This is clearly a image file. And if we use file, um, it is JPEG data, right? So it is definitely an image. We opened it, we proved it with the file command. Um, if we look at the uh, script that, that would generate this, um, this Python script, it's literally just using requests to retrieve, uh, to retrieve that file and save it out. And so uh, additionally, if we were to use file on catcall.py, it's going to tell us that it's, it's, it's a Python script, right? Um, but let's, let's show an interesting use case here. So Typically, when you upload a file to a web server, it's going to check the magic bytes as well as maybe the extension. And then maybe uh, with more advanced setups or if they're actually secure, they'd be checking the contents of the file as well. 
But let's assume they're not. Let's assume they're not checking the contents of the file and they're just checking the magic pipe to the front. Well, we've got this PHP reverse shell. This is a, a, a standard file that um, from Pentest Monkey, actually, if you're familiar with uh, this, this file, um, that we can use to get a shell through web servers, typically anything that's running PHP. And if we run file on this, it's very obviously a PHP script, ASCII text. If there's a web filter in place, this is not going to be allowed through. However, look at this not malware.php.jpg. Well, in this case, if we cat, uh, if we run file on this command, we see this is JPEG image data. But if we actually cat out the file, it's the same script. And so how do we do this, right? Well, we did it by manipulating the magic bytes in the front of the file. And so let's uh, run XXD to get the bytes of the PHP script. And we'll just do head to get the first you know, series of them, right? And so this starts with 3C3F7068, right? This is the PHP tag. Let's do this now onto the uh, not a, uh, not malware, right? And we'll run head and we'll see this file has four bytes in the front. And this series of bytes is the magic bytes or one of the magic bytes sequences for a JPEG, JPEG file. And to prove that, we're also gonna run XXD on the image file. And if we do this, you'll see this image file starts with FFD8, FFDB, the same thing we have here. And so even though the magic bytes are identifying the file. If we run the script, um, I don't know if this actually will make sense to you, but the point being that uh, PHP is running this code, right? PHP will also run this code and it's gonna do the same thing even though the magic bytes um, are, are representing an image file. And so we can use this whole concept to bypass upload filters. Um, but the point here is that everything in, in Unix systems or Linux systems are represented as files and all those files are identified by their magic bytes. Now I was debating whether or not to do this last portion of the video, uh, but I think it's something that I sort of struggled with for a long time or just uh, sort of not, not really struggled with, but just sort of a concept that I wasn't aware of uh, and didn't really appreciate the context of. Uh, and so what, what I'm going to be talking about here is uh, PTYs and TTYs. And so this concept comes from the original days of computing, like a lot of the stuff we've talked about. And a, a TTY is, originally it was a teletype writer uh, prompt on a mainframe. And so it was the actual input output system on that on that terminal. And if you remember uh, at the beginning of this video, or the, the uh, thumbnail for this video is a typewriter, right? And the reason is a pseudo terminal is a, a PTS, is, uh, stands for pseudo terminal slave, and it's represented by PTY. And so a, a PTY is different than a direct TTY uh, because it is a master slave relationship. Uh, you can think of examples of this being things like SSH, where you shell into a system and then you're running commands on that system, but you're remote. And originally this was done through basically a, you can think of it kind of like a zero client actually, where you have the system running a main terminal unit and then remotely you have a keyboard and a screen and you're sending commands and then it's going over the wire and then the actual mainframe is executing them. Uh, so SSH would be examples of this. The only thing I'm going to show for this section is just how you would look up um, what it is. So you could do a PS, I got to focus in here, a PS dash A and this is going to give you um, from where you are, right? I, we'd have to use sudo to do more stuff, but the, effectively the same thing. Uh, you have uh, pseudo terminal, right? Uh, one and two, and these are the pseudo terminals for the process, right? So you can use this to kind of look up whether you are a pseudo terminal or a or a tele teletype terminal, and then from that point, you can actually go and kill the um, session that's connected. So, say you have an attacker in your system, and you want to disconnect them without disconnecting the network connection, for example, you can use a series of of code to look up the process ID by the um, PTY or look up the PTY and then associate uh, the connection with it and kill the process from there. Um, so there's a lot to this, uh, but it's not that complicated, quite frankly. So generally, like another example of this, you'd be on a system, uh, you get a shell on a system, maybe using the reverse shell we just we showed, the PHP reverse shell. And from that, you just have like a bare bones terminal with no header and you want support for tabs or whatever else. Um, there's Python code or bash environment code that you can use to get back your terminal and set your context uh, so that it actually behaves properly. 
Um, and so this whole concept is just you got to know what you are a PTY or uh, or TTY, and how you would uh, you would interact with those um, from that standpoint. Thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. If you got anything out of this video, I would really appreciate a like on it to let me know that you enjoy the content and help me get it out to more folks. Get the algorithm to pick it up. Subscribe to the channel for more of that. I'm doing these videos about three times a week. So if you subscribe, you should get another video in just a few days. But with all that said, I appreciate you stopping by uh, and I will see you guys just in the next video.